Once again, glad to see everyone back this afternoon. This afternoon, our lesson is going to be looking at backsliding, particularly the heart of the backslider. We know that there are people living in this world who have backslidden away from Christ and some who continue to do so. And over Matthew chapter 13, we have a parable that was given to us. And if you want to be turning there, I'll make some introductory remarks while you're getting to that passage. Today, as we look at this lesson, we're going to look at three different reasons why a person may backslide. First of all, here, she has no realization of the word. Secondly, there are no rudiments in the faith. And finally, no restraints from evil in their heart. Look at Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. We can read, And the same day Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell in stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up, and choked them. But others fell on the good ground, and brought forth fruit some 100, some 60, and some 30-fold. Who hath the ears to hear, let him hear. Now drop down to verse 18 of that same passage, and he's going to explain what the parable is. He says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone who heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the word by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it, and yet he hath not root in himself, but endureth for a while. For when tribulations and persecutions ariseth, because of the word by and by he is offended. And he also that received the seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. But he that receiveth the seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some one hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So as we look at that parable, we can see that there are different ones who have different issues or different areas of life that help them understand or fail to understand what's going on, and we, we see that progression here. Jesus calls this parable the parable of the sower. We know what the seed is. The seed is the word of God, and he tells us that in the passage. The soils are the hearts of men, and there are four types. Three evil, only one good. We're going to focus mainly on the three evil soils because we're talking about backsliding. The fourth soil, the good soil, is that which brings forth a lot of fruit, some hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. So as we look at the word backslide, the word backslide means one who no longer makes any progress. In the Christian life, we're either growing or we're dying. You can't stand still in the Christian life. As we study God's word and we obey it and live it, we're growing. We cease to do that, we cease to grow. We start going on a decline. Think about it this way. When you eat food every meal, you're going to grow. Sometimes you grow out. Sometimes you grow up. But we still grow. And when we eat our food, it, food, it nourishes us. It keeps us strong. It keeps us healthy. Particularly when we eat the right kinds of food. So look at one who stops eating. What happens to them? Eventually they're going to die. Their health gets in decline, they become weaker physically, they actually become weaker mentally as well, 
They're not getting the nutrients to feed the brain for the brain to work properly, for the body to work properly. You start losing functions of various parts of the body and ultimately you die. It's the easiest way we can explain it. The seed is the Word of God. The seed brings forth a fruit or a plant. You plant something in the ground, it brings forth, and you enjoy the benefits of that. I haven't grown a garden in a long time, but I used to love growing a garden. Growing up, my great-grandfather lived with us. He had a garden. And it was part of my job, particularly in the summertime when I was off from school, to help him in his garden. I got tired of hoeing and weeding the garden, but I learned something. I learned that you don't want those weeds around because it chokes out the plants or it takes away from their nutrients. You can let the weeds grow up and you can still produce some fruit or some food, some vegetables, but not as much because all that grass and weeds coming around those plants are going to take away from the nutrients in the ground to help everything grow the way it should. I remember my grandfather, one of, both of my grandfathers had gardens, but one of my grandfathers would grow watermelons occasionally. And he started growing big watermelons and entered them into contests. And I remember one time he had a, I think it was a 70-pound watermelon. And I couldn't figure out as a boy how he could grow a watermelon that large. Well, I found out as those other shoots started coming out, he was plucking them off. So he'd have one shoot with one watermelon, and he nourished, he took care of that until it was a watermelon about this big around. And that's the only one he had on that vine. Now, he had other, other watermelon hills that he had planted that he got regular-sized watermelons off of, and we'd eat them. But when he wanted to go to the contest, he made sure he had only one. So nothing would take away from the nutrients in that. Now, he could grow a large one. So you think about the seed, the Word of God, when we study God's Word, and we receive it in our hearts through obedience, and we live it, and we continue to let it grow in our hearts through study and obedience... We continue to grow. We become stronger and more mature spiritually. But the backsliding person is just the very opposite. The backsliding person is one who has no realization of the word. If you looked at the parable back in the first few verses, this tells us that the seed is trampled underfoot. Now verse 3 starts this parable, some fell by the wayside. And the fowls came and devoured them. You throw some by the wayside, what's going to happen? If you throw them in a path where you walk, people are going to trample it. It's not going to take hold. It's not going to grow. The seeds are just going to die. It may be on a hard road or on rocky soil, but those thrown by the wayside never sink down into the ground, into the soil, and they don't produce anything. The interpretation of this is that the word is ignored and henceforth never understood. Some people, you can read the Bible to them, they'll never understand it because they don't want to understand it. They've got in their minds what they believe and what they think, and that's as far as they're going to go. I spoke to someone one time about the Bible and tried to set up a Bible study, and I said, let's study from God's Word. Well, I'll tell you what I believe. I said, it doesn't matter what you believe or what I believe. It matters what the God, Word of God says. And this person said, I don't care what the Word of God says. I don't care anything about what the Bible teaches. I know what I feel in my heart. Remember this morning, this person was pointing right here. I know what I feel in my heart. I don't care what the Bible says. That's the person that falls by the wayside, and that's a very good example of that happening because this person could care less about the Bible at all. It was all feelings and emotions, and we can't be governed by our feelings and emotions when it comes to being a Christian and wanting to go to heaven. It's not up to us to determine what we like and what we dis dislike. It's not up to us and our own feelings and emotions to decide what we're going to believe. God's Word settles it all. We shouldn't think that we're as good or as smart as God and say, well, you know what, I think I can come up with some good stuff on my own. I know what I think and I know what I believe. I'm going to live the way I want to live. But there are a lot of people in this world that do that. They're that first soil. It never takes root. When you look at the application of this, this person has no realization of the word because he does not pay attention to the word. Jesus even warned of that in the Bible. If you look over in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, we can see this. When Jesus said, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which buildeth his house upon a rock. 
The rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. Now that's the good soil. That's where someone listened. But look at this next part of it. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon a sand. The rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. That's what we're talking about here. These are people who won't pay attention to the word. They're not on solid ground. They're on sinking sand. They're on shifting sands. If you look at, at oceans and you look at the sands, those things will shift from time to time. We don't need that in, in Christianity. We need to pay attention to the word. But Jesus warned of those kind of people. James also speaks of those people as well, of the one who hears and does not follow what the Bible teaches. In James 1, 21 through 25, James wrote, Wherefore laying apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save his soul. That's the good soul. That's what we want to be. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or in a mirror. He beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, the Bible says, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. He tells us that we're to receive the word with meekness. Those who have gone by the wayside or the seeds are thrown by the wayside for those people, it never takes hold. They don't listen. They don't look at it. They don't receive with meekness the engrafted word, and it doesn't save their soul because that's not what they want. They want to do what they want to do. And he tells us in verse 22 that we need to hear the word, but we need to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We first must hear the word of God, but it has to be implanted in our heart through a study of God's word. And it's implanted when we receive it with meekness, that engrafted word, and it's able to save our souls. But when we don't, and we're a hearer only, we listen to it and say, Yeah, 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 okay, I know it, I know it, whatever. That's kind of the attitude that so many people have today. They care less about what the Bible teaches. And they don't want to follow it, and they're not going to follow it. They're just going to do what they want to do. But he said, that person that wants to do what he wants to do and does not listen to the Bible is like walking up in the mirror, and you look, okay, everything's in place. I think, okay, I'm ready to go. And then you leave, and you forget how you looked when you looked in that mirror the first time. It's interesting. I see people going down the road looking in the mirrors, I guess they, they think, oh, I look so good. Let me give it another look while I drive. And they look in the mirrors. Most of the time, it's women putting their makeup on. I see that every day. They're putting their makeup on, fixing their hair, whatever they're going to do. Got a cup of coffee in one hand and, a, and an eyeliner brush in the other hand. They're trying to drive with their knees. and Well, they get tickets when that happens. But anyway, you see that a lot. People want to go back and look in the mirror. Why do you want to go back and look in the mirror after you looked at it an hour ago? Because you want to make sure your hair's not out of the place. I don't have to worry about that, so I don't have to worry about a mirror. Uh, but people don't, men and women both, make sure their hair's out, not out of place and everything's looking good. And make sure their clothes are on just right. It's not, not wrinkled up or twisted around while you're sitting in the car. So they want to check everything out. What does it matter? You already put it on. But that's what they do. But when it comes to God's Word, they'll listen to somebody talk about it, but then they'll say, eh, I don't need it. And they forget about it. They forget how they are. And that's the problem. Because without God, we're nothing. Without God, we're sinners. Without God, we're lost. And yet that is what happens to those on the wayside. Because they don't want to hear it. The one on the wayside puts off the understanding the word. Simon the sorcerer, in Acts chapter 8, verse 17, didn't understand God's word. And we see that Peter and John went down and, and they, after Philip had preached and converted some, they sent Peter and John down to lay hands on these people. And in verse 17 it says, They laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands that the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also that whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. Notice what Peter's response was. 
Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thine heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thine wickedness, and pray that God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee, for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. Whether Peter, or whether uh, when Peter dealt with, with this and with Simon, whether he was sincere or not, it sounds like he just, he was a sorcerer, by the way, if you read prior to that. We refer to him as Simon the sorcerer. He practiced witchcraft and trickery. Now Simon in his own heart and his own mind might have been thinking, oh boy, I can make more money. If I get this and I can lay hands on people, that might, might help me. Then again, he could have just, through his ignorance, said, uh, I'll give you some money if you give that to me because I could impart the Holy Spirit on people then. That doesn't say whether it's sincere or not in this passage, but it does tell us that his motives were wrong. Oh, I'll pay you some money to get the Holy Spirit. Wrong attitude. He was wrong in everything he did in this. But he didn't understand the words or reason. Oh, Felix is the same. In Acts chapter 24 and verse 25, and Felix, as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way at this time, for at a convenient season I will call for thee. Oh, when I have a convenient season, Paul, I'll call for you, but not right now. I'm not ready for it. Lack of understanding of the word. Paul preached to him. He told him what he needed to do. Told him about his error and his sins, and here's how to get out of it. He was trying to save this man, and he didn't want it. He fell by the wayside. Next, let's look at the rudiments of the work. The parable on this second front was the one that fell on rocky soil. And when it fell on that rocky soil, the seed germinated and it sprouted. But because it was so rocky, the roots could not penetrate into the ground enough to get enough, enough depth to get water and nutrients. And as soon as the sun came up, it dried it out. You want to look at the interpretation of that from that latter section of, the, of our passage? When the word is sown on stony ground, it is thrown in a shallow heart. The word may impact the person because of emotions or feelings at that time and they know that they're wrong and they, they say they want to change. And they do to some extent to where they become a Christian. But it doesn't penetrate deep into their life. And when persecutions and problems in their life come, they don't have the foundation wherewith they will remain faithful to God. You've seen it. We've seen it here, and I've seen it everywhere I've lived. Somebody has taught the Word of God. They're gung-ho. They're ready to go. Oh, I want this. I know I need this. And for the first month, two months, three months, it may be six months, you'll see them at every service. They're wanting to be involved in every act of the uh, work of the church. They want to do everything they can, and then the problem comes in their life. It may be a family problem, it may be a work problem, some kind of persecution. Something happens in their life and it shakes them to their core. And they say, why would God, a good God, allow me to go through this? Or, why me? Why am I dealing with this? And they become discouraged. And they fall away. And spiritually they dry up and die. That's what happens to those on the stony ground. The application of this is he doesn't study the word enough or she doesn't study the word enough to gain the necessary foundation to live faithfully. They have that problem because they're not getting into the word and studying it and learning it and applying it to their lives just as James 1 told us. You apply that to your lives. You bring forth fruit when you do that is what we find on the good soil when it falls on good ground. They don't do that. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 tells us all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Notice that. The Bible gives us instruction in righteousness. Imagine that. But people don't read their Bibles like they should. 
that the man of God may be perfect or complete, truly or thoroughly furnished unto every good work. When we read and we study the Bible, knowing it's given by inspiration from God himself, it is profitable for doctrine. It teaches us the doctrine of God's word so we'll know what to do and what not to do. It gives us instructions. It helps us in making it through life. It gives us that foundation where we can grow spiritually and live. But those on the stony ground, it doesn't take hold because they don't read, they don't study, they don't live it like they should, and problems come along in their lives and they just can't handle it. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Some translations say you're handling aright the word of truth. If you handle God's word rightly and you study it properly, you're going to grow. If you don't study God's word, you're not going to grow. Some people think, well, I go to church on Sundays. That's where I get my, my Bible learning from. The preacher tells me what to do, and I, I, I listen to that. Or the Bible class teacher teaches a good lesson, and next week I'll pick my Bible up again and look at it again. Do you eat once a week? Remember, let's go back to the food analogy. Do you eat once a week? No, none of us do. When we're sick, we don't feel like eating, but usually we put a little something in our body because we know we've got to keep some strength up. But on a regular basis, we're going to eat. I'm going to eat three meals a day at least. My guys on my shift kind of laugh because uh, when we come into work, I say, what are we going to eat tonight? That's one of the first things I tell them. If we're in the office, what are we going to eat? We need to start deciding this. It's two or three hours before we're going to eat. And one of them said, boy, all you think about is eating. I said, you got that right. I'm not going to go hungry. I'm ready to eat something whenever. Sometimes I might stop and get a snack somewhere at the, at the convenience store. We like to eat. Most of us do. You want to live, you're going to eat. You're going to like to eat. But we've got to do that to nourish us. And spiritually, it's the same way. We've got to understand God's Word. We have to study it so we can grow. He doesn't understand that the work of the Christian life encompasses the whole life, not just one day a week when we come to worship. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. That in the name of the Lord Jesus is by His authority. So everything we do, we have to have biblical authority for. We can't say, well, the Bible doesn't say that, but you know it doesn't condemn it, so I'm going to do it anyway. That's not the right attitude to have when it comes to God's Word. God's Word tells us what to do and what not to do. There's going to be something in there that tells you not to do something. But if it tells you to do something, you do it. The silence of the scriptures does not allow us to take liberties to do whatever we want. But that's what people in this world think. Matthew 16, 24 through 26, Jesus said unto disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We deny ourselves. Some people say, I'm not denying myself of anything. I do what I want. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The person backslides... Because it does not have the knowledge need, needed to endure persecution. 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16 tells us, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer of the reason of hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that they that speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you of your good conversation or good life in Christ. See, there are going to be people that's going to falsely accuse us of things. They're going to say things about us and try to hurt us, hurt our reputation. But if we know we're living right, people can say what they want to say. They're spreading lies. They're deceiving people. They're doing whatever. What do we want to do? Get back at them? That's what this world does. We can confront them and say, you're telling lies about me. But that's not getting back at them. That's confronting a problem. But you live your life as you know you're living it, and God knows you're living it, and your brethren and your family know you're living it. And God's going to still bless us, and it doesn't matter what some people think or say about us. Still live a Christian life. And evildoers are going to speak bad of us. There, if there has not been a time in your life that someone has not tried to hurt you, there will be. I promise you that. Because if you live right and do right, somebody's going to try to make you look bad or try to hurt you. Let's notice now the restraints from the world. The parable, 
The seed is cast on a thorny ground. The seed germinates and grows. But the other plants around it don't allow the food source to help that plant need to, needed to live and thrive and to grow, and it dies. You look at the interpretation of that, the word is put in the child of God. When he obeys a Christian, or obeys a gospel rather, to become a Christian, this person listens to the word, he obeys, becomes a Christian. However, the influence of his worldly friends and his worldly desires does not allow him to grow. So the application of this is this person has no restraint from the world because he still loves the world. 1 John 2, 15-17 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, is of the world. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of the Father abideth forever. Notice there are three areas of temptation. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. He said, that's of the world. If we love the world, we have those in our heart, in our lives. If we love God, we put those things out of our lives, and we live and abide forever with God. In other words, he's saying, I'm going to give you heaven as your home. But you've got to live it if you're going to get heaven. Life is the big test. And God is grading us how, and how we're living here. And if we fail the test, we're not going to go to heaven. There are people that say, well, it don't matter if you fail the test. God's going to let you in anyway because of His grace. God's grace only extends to those who are going to do what's right and live right. God's grace is offered to all. We can read that in Titus 2, 11 and 12. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. His grace is has been offered to all men. It appears before all men. But that grace is a teaching grace. It teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So, according to that passage, who does it say is going to receive God's grace in the end to go to heaven? Those who live soberly, righteously, and godly. Those who live immoral lives and sinful lives, God's grace is not going to reach them. Not because it can't, because God said He's not going to give people grace who disobey Him continually day in and day out and live like the devil. People who live like the devil are father of the devil, not God. And Jesus even referred to those in John chapter 8 when He told the, some of the Jews, you are of your father the devil. These were some of the most religious people in the world. And He said, your father is the devil, not God. And that's the way it is with so many today. Even some religious people, a lot of religious people, their father's not God. They'll tell you it is. They'll put on some big show that it is, but their father's the devil because that's who they follow. And they're going to go where their father is. For those who want to receive the grace of God have to live soberly, righteously, and godly and do His will in order to go to heaven when this life is over. Those who are on that ground also associate with people of the world. And I'm not talking about just associating. We've got to associate to some extent because we live here in this world. We just don't have to be of the world and do what they do. We have to associate people we work with every day. doesn't mean we agree with them. doesn't mean we go along with what they do. But these are people who go along with everything because they go along to get along. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Be not deceived. Evil companionships corrupts good morals. He backslides as a result of it. And when a person does backslide and does not live the life they should be living, they're doing so because they let the world influence them. 1 John 4, 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We have to let God have his influence over us, not the world have his influence over us. The world and the word are at conflict with one another. John chapter 17, 14, Jesus even says, I have given them thy word, and the world that hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. The world hates you when you do what's right. But Jesus said God loves you when you do what's right. So we have to make the choice. Is it going to be God or the devil? This world or heaven, which is really going to be heaven or hell. 
but we're going to follow the things in this world that's going to keep us out of heaven and cause us to lose our soul in hell, or are we going to follow God? We've noticed three evil hearts that lead to backsliding. The one who has no realization of the word, it falls by the wayside. One who has no rudiments of the work of God because it's on stony ground, has no depth and the sun dries it up, or when it comes to the person that becomes a Christian, the world dries them up because he's too involved in it and has no restraints from the world, can't let the world out of his life and out of his heart. And many of those people battle. They, they say, well, I want to do what's right, but boy, this looks so fun over here. And I know it's wrong, but I'm still going to do it. We have to practice self-control as Christians, follow God's word faithfully so that heaven can be our home. As a child of God, if you have wandered away, maybe you're one of those grounds, the stony or the thorny ground, and you're not living the life that you should be living, then why not come back and ask God to forgive you? Start living a faithful life, getting back on that straight and narrow pathway that will lead you to life, and heaven will be your home. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, you can come through obedience to that gospel through your faith, repentance, confessing Jesus with the mouth, and be immersed in baptism for the remission of your sins. Live a faithful Christian life, putting away the world and the things in it, to serve Jesus Christ faithfully and heaven will be your home. If you are subject in any way today, come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing?